Hello. Thanks for listening. I thought since I'm practicing this presentation for a conference next week, I'd add some Delaware specific stuff and send it on over to you. So who am I? Well, they call me Dr. Tiny and I believe that people deserve healthy housing options near where they work, learn, play and pray at a price their salary allows them to afford. I work with housing advocates, elected officials and community leaders who struggle with not having enough housing that is affordable by using tiny homes. So this speech share will highlight some facts about tiny homes and then we'll dive into why they may be one solution for expanding housing. So why tiny? Well, because you only have to live and pay for what you need. First, I have to explain the difference between a shelter and a tiny house. Shelters are used for a roof over somebody's head. There's usually a shared community, restroom, showers, kitchen, and eating facilities, whereas a tiny house is defined by the International Residential Code as a house being less than 400 square feet. So the two pictures here, you can see they're do-it-yourselfers, and they are very small, very tiny, very tiny. Well, how big is big? Here's one that is built, um, it's a standard model from Tumbleweed, and you can see that it's 215 square feet plus the loft. And then you have another higher end one that is also built, and that's uh, built through Wheelhouse, and you can see the d difference in the price. And really, the price depends on the size and the features of the home. So what does Tiny look like? Tinies can be on wheels and movable, or built on a site like a conventional house, or built in a factory like a modular home like Barrica, and delivered to a prepared site. And along with those types, people also use sheds, shipping containers, and cargo vans for this type of living. I just wanted to describe to you the difference between a park model, which is what is being sold at Great Outdoors in Georgetown, as compared to something that is built um, like in Berica. So I work with both of these companies and the difference is, is that the park models are usually only used for something like around nine months out of the year because of the insulation and um, windows, etc. So if you were to use a park model structure all year round, there just needs to be some modifications. Whereas using Berica, you get everything you need all at once and, um, and you can pick lower end products so you can keep your costs down. So what are not tiny houses? Well, you've got your travel trailers, your campers, or your motor homes. And if you look at that picture right there, you can see the difference side by side. So are tiny homes just a fad? Not really. The interest in the market is slowly and gradually increasing and it's forecasted to grow to three and a half million dollars by 2026. And since 1950, house sizes have grown from 1,000 square feet to 2,200 square feet, square feet. So now we are going back to the future and more than half of Americans would like to live in a tiny house for reasons we'll cover. So why would somebody live in a tiny house? Let me just give you a quick uh, few reasons. Downsizing or right sizing, and it helps not to leave the kids with a big house to empty. Environmentally friendly with a footprint, lower footprint, faster to build, lower cost of purchase and utility costs, easier maintenance, and you can live by family, or if you wanted to travel, you could. And by the way, most people do not travel around in a tiny house like they would with a road vehicle. And in fact, most tinies only move locations up to three times a year. And lastly, the freedom of time and money to pursue passion projects, since people don't have to worry about a large payment and debt. So who's living in these houses? More women than men. 
tiny house people are two times as likely to hold a master's degree and on on par with the average college graduation rates. The average income of the person is about $42,000 and two fifths of the owners are over 50. And I threw in this extra chart because it breaks down um, renting. And what was interesting is the renting correlates with why people live in a tiny house. But what is interesting about this chart is that it breaks it down to age to see who would um, live in a tiny house and who wouldn't by the age groups. So here's a list of some reasons why I think uh, tinies can be used to increase housing stock. I wanna make a distinction here that tinies that are being used for Airbnbs or seasonal rentals is not included in this conversation because they don't include affordable housing increases. And I also included a little uh, select your payment plan here. This is from a company that builds tiny houses and they of course finance them on their own and um, they are less than a thousand dollars a month. So a, a real option here. As a researcher, I like to have data to support what I'm saying. And there's not a lot of data right now on tiny houses. Here's just four of my top questions about tiny houses. So the only thing I can go by is lessons learned and best practices for tiny house communities and tiny houses being used as accessory dwelling units across the country. And this is just a small list of how tinies or small houses can be used to impact affordable housing in your community. So with all these positive aspects of the tiny homes, what is stopping people to use them? From a consumer's perspective, there's a lot of obstacles, like they're listed here. Some of the main ones I just wanna point out is a lot of municipalities have not adopted them and they are illegal due to the policies on the books and some of the infrastructure that's needed for tiny houses may be too costly for individuals. And lastly, there's no specific financing like an FHA loan or a VA or a conventional loan for tinies. And uh, the insurance products are somewhat dubious. I have talked to some local bankers to see if they can create a product, so stand by. So from a planner's perspective, why are tiny houses problematic? Well, you can see a lot of the same reasons overlap with consumers. And the biggest one, and uh, one that the Sussex Housing Group is starting to tackle, is nimbyism. People don't understand that housing is everyone's concern. And we really wanna make that an approach so that affordable housing is more palatable. So how can the barriers be removed to make tiny legal? Well, of course, the first bullet is the same as the missing middle challenges and wins. The second one is looking at innovative building techniques to get the price down, the price point. Third one is to look at new ways to zone communities and opportunities there. Another one is how do we actually produce income from these via taxes? And lastly, the building codes themselves, there are no standardizations, so the industry is coming up with their own, and I sit on both of those committees. So the bottom line is you want to think of tiny living and tiny footprints and small parcels and small use of community resources. Think short in height and short for walking distance, such that you have a big solution for maximum in input, it, impact. So not everybody wants to live in a tiny house. Some choose for the several reasons that I mentioned, but it may be a practical, effective solution to expand housing availability and affordability. So thanks for attending. And to learn more, here's my email address and number. Give me a call so we can talk housing needs and see if 
if tinies and smalls can work for your community. Thanks so much.